Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the War for Badab. Where, with the recent Second Battle of the Sagan Naval Yards, the Loyalists had found themselves in a commanding strategic position, and with a pair of unusual luxuries on their hands. Time and opportunity. With the stable warp routes from Sagan in Loyalist hands, and Surengrad having been liberated as well, after Carab Cullum's mad plan to dispatch the raptors and salamanders to secure it from the traitors, they now possessed a cordon right astride the usual routes between the Endymion Cluster and Badab, separating the Astral Claws once and for all from the Mantis warriors, who fell back to protect their own fiefdom in the cluster. And so Luft Huron found himself with but two thirds of his warders. The logical next step, therefore, of course, was to deprive him of the other third as well, the Lamenters, who had proven to be a slippery foe in the Pale Stars, despite the Minotaurs rampaging across that area of space, burning, looting, pillaging, and smashing everything they came across, they had yet to bring the Lamenters to a decisive battle where real casualties could be inflicted upon the Yellow Sons of Sanguinius. And as much as the Minotaurs had been enjoying their fight with the Executioners, they too were beginning to pull out of the system more and more, looking for softer targets, raiding Loyalist supply lines, which had started to become plentiful again in the Pale Stars. As the Loyalists figured that there might be some opportunity to run tribute ships through them once more, once the favoured targets of the Lamenters which made it all the more strange when their predations seemed relatively limited everything considered. Which led Loyalist Command to theorize that the Lamenters must have taken considerable damage up until this point. They had primarily been attacking soft targets going through the Pale Stars to be sure, but for every 10 soft targets, they'd come across an 11th, escorted by Loyalist Space Marines. This was even more frequent, of course, when the Marines errands were still in the war, but the Firehawks had seen to that. And the Minotaurs had precisely zero interests in protecting some random tithe traffic traveling through their battle zone. In fact, it could consider itself damn lucky if it wasn't shot at for getting in the way. But still, despite the lack of decisive engagements, the Minotaurs had made solid contact with the Lamenters on multiple occasions, and there was also the catastrophically failed assault upon Vengeance Station to take into account. Now, the Loyalists did not know that that had cost the Lamenters one of their warships, but the decrease in activity again suggested that they had been severely weakened. There's of course also the simple fact that the Lamenters are... <laughs> the Lamenters. Oh, they've undoubtedly taken attrition, all right. But that only made the Minotaur's jobs even harder. The Lamenters have been operating in the Pale Stars for a century now. They knew every nook and cranny, every hide hole, every escape route, every stable warp current, and when to use them for maximum effect. The Minotaurs, on the other hand, were relative newcomers, and whilst they had smashed and burned everything they could get their hands on, apparently that still wasn't enough to draw out the Lamenters. Something new had to be done, and just as the chapter master of the Minotaurs, um, Asterian Moloch, began to have his patience tested, a coded communique arrived from Legate Inquisitor John Dice Frame. Contained within the data package was a set of coordinates, which seemed to point towards absolutely nothing according to the Minotaur's own star charts, but according to ancient records unearthed by the Legate Inquisitor's investigatory team, the initial exploratory elements into this sector of space had in fact discovered a small planet which they dubbed Optera. 
He was so out of the way, so thoroughly unimportant and unevolved, as to be considered completely uninteresting, and hence not noted down on modern day star charts. But that lack of interest was precisely what made it so intriguing. A small backwater world on no modern charts, with no civilization to speak of, and hence no radiation signature, no high powered communications, no power emitters, and none of the usual noise emitted by civilized planets, and a feral world to boot, which might just have a population of hardy backwater savage humanity fighting tooth and nail every day against the environment simply just to survive. Prime recruiting material for an Astartes chapter, Desperate for Replacement Recruits. Hmm. Out of the way, secreted, little known, difficult to detect, and with potential recruiting stock. Oh yes, this system absolutely deserved a bit of closer investigation, it did. But the Minotaurs were busy with other things, and frankly, they were not a particularly sneaky chapter. And so, the Imperial Navy was called upon. A pair of small, light escort frigates was dispatched, along with a few interceptors laden down with advanced sensor equipment. The ships would arrive out of the warp, far, far, far outside of the usual areas trafficked in any normal solar system. Then, over the course of weeks, if not months, they would coast ever so slowly in towards the planet Optera, with only minimal life support being allowed. Once they had gotten well within the envelope of their sensoriums, the ships slowly began waking up their machine spirits that reached out to search the void around the planet Optera. Many a tense hours passed with no clear results, and the captain of the lead frigate was about to order the ships to unmask themselves and bring all sensors to full power for a final scan when a low-powered transmission was detected, something that should not be emitting from any feral world yet bore a resemblance to the kind of communication you might see between a ground team and ships in low orbit. Redirecting their sensors, they discovered what appeared to be an oddly blank spot in space, an area where the background radiation of the universe was somehow being blocked and or distorted, indicating the presence of a very large warship hanging in orbit around the planet. The sheer size of the thing made identification, despite the lack of hard data and information, relatively simple. This could only be the Lamenter's chief capital vessel, the battle barge Mater Lacrimarum. And now that it had been found, the next question of course was what to do about it. The initial Minotaur response would of course be to rush in, trampling over anything and everything they found, but in this particular instance, Chapter Master Asterion Moloch stepped on the brakes. Somewhat uncharacteristic, perhaps, but again, I remind you, the Minotaurs are not merely just a berserk chapter. There is a deep-rooted discipline and pragmatism that guides their brutality. They don't bird, smash, destroy, and kill just because it's funny, though it occasionally is. They do so for a purpose. And Moloch had spotted a far greater one in this. What is a Lamenter's battle barge, the oldest, largest, and most powerful vessel in the entirety of a fleet-based chapter doing orbiting some no-name backwater world in the middle of nowhere? What could possibly be so important as to tear it away from the war even now raging in the Pale Stars? As we'd already mentioned, there is the possibility that this world could have been used for some sort of recruitment, 
But even at the best of times, it takes years to train an elevator battle brother. Surely, the Lamenters would not have set aside one of their mightiest vessels for such a lengthy purpose. No, there must be some other reason, perhaps connected with the decrease in Lamenters activity in general. But despite the Minotaurs having an often dim view of other Astartes' chapters, viewing them as hesitant, as unwilling to do what truly needed to be done to ensure the greater glory of the God Emperor, for example, when Legate Inquisitor John Dyer's Frayne maneuvered so as to see the Nova Marines and the Raptors, amongst others, reassigned away from the Badab War, this news was met with concern from Carab Cullen, but welcomed by the Minotaurs. Weak, gentle chapters, without the stomach for the war to come. Much better than to see them replaced by the Exorcists, Star Phantoms and Sons of Medusa, chapters of far sterner purpose. Perhaps the Lamenters were likewise wary of the conflict seeking to hide away instead of facing the might of the Minotaurs. But then again, they had fought well so far. They had resisted the Minotaurs with all the might left to them, and fought them in repeated engagements, always managing to stay just one step ahead of annihilation. It seemed more likely then that the Lamenters must have some strategic reason for their reticence here. And since recruitment is out of the question due to the time it would require, the only remaining logical reason would be that the Lamenters were trying to augment their combat forces by allowing wounded battle brothers to recuperate aboard the largest, most extensive and advanced medical facility yet remaining to them, their chapter's home, the Mater Lacriarum. Asterian Moloch therefore hypothesized that the reason why the battle barge was seemingly keeping to the edges of the conflict was because it had a mass of wounded brothers aboard, which suddenly made this a far more interesting strategic target. Not to kill the wounded, mind you, that would certainly be a bonus, but there was a grander goal here. Oh, the battle barge would be attacked all right, but it would be kept alive at all costs, merely deprived of its ability to leave the system. And so the aid of the Imperial Navy was enlisted once more. A lightning strike force was dispatched to the system as quickly as possible, utilizing smaller, faster Imperial Navy vessels and a handful of Minotaur strike craft that could be gathered up quickly pushing the skill of their astropathic contingent to the absolute limit. The Minotaur's force exited warp space as deep into the system as possible and far beyond the usual safety limits. And before the wound in reality had even fully closed behind the Gellifields, they were collapsed and real space engines ignited. It was now a race against time. The Mater Lacriarum would attempt to escape as quickly as possible, knowing that it had been discovered. The Minotaur strike force raced ahead straight into its guns, caring not at all for the damage inflicted, for the armor plating stripped away from their armored prows as they zoomed in directly towards the battle barge, aiming to pass just to its stern. Many Imperial warships were undoubtedly heavily damaged, perhaps even destroyed in such a hazardous action, but it achieved its intended purpose. One of the vessels managed to slip in behind the Lamenter's battle barge and hammer its engine block from point-blank range, before speeding away out of range once more, leaving the Lamenter's battle barge stuck in system. But why was the vessel not simply destroyed, you may ask? Well, the answer to that question shortly thereafter arrived in Solar System, as the Minotaur's fleet, now gathered in full chapter strength, recorded the arrival of the first Lamenter warship.
They knew it was a trap, of course. The Minotaurs were making absolutely no efforts whatsoever to conceal their presence. But that was the beauty of Asterion Moloch's plan. He had discovered an objective in the Lamenters' capital battle barge that the Lamenters had to defend. Or more correctly, they had to protect the wounded battle brothers it carried. And regardless of the reason, the fact remained that the Minotaurs had nailed the Lamenters down to a single objective, a single set of coordinates in orbit around a single world. And so now, the Minotaurs would have their decisive battle. They would even be so gentlemanly as to wait for the Lamenters to arrive in full force and take up positions around the stricken battle barge and upon the surface of Optera. Why? Well, part of it was because this was precisely the kind of conflict the Minotaurs relished. The ability to take the fight to humanity's most lethal and perfidious opponent, Traitor Astartes. Regardless of whether or not the Lamenters might dispute such a label. But it was also for practical reasons. The Minotaurs wanted the bulk of the Lamenters' fleet to arrive. This was to be a decisive battle after all, and if they simply picked off single vessels, the others would soon wisen up to the impossibility of their task, and decide to be elsewhere. It had taken the Minotaurs the better part of a year or two to track the Lamenters down, and they weren't about to let them slip away now. And so when a sufficient number had entered the net, the battle could begin in full force, both upon the surface of Optera V and in the void, with massed and ferociously fought boarding actions flowing back and forth, ships firing lance batteries and point-blank torpedo volleys at one another. The engagement would last for a full 17 hours of slogging, brutal warfare, the likes of which had rarely been seen in the entirety of the campaign. The Minotaurs had the advantage of numbers and positioning. They also had nailed the Lamenters down to a single objective which they had to defend. This allowed the Minotaurs to gang up on the Lamenters vessels in orbit, launching multiple waves of boarding parties from multiple ships to overwhelm the defenders, crippling the vessels or outright destroying them by fighting their way to their primary plasma drives and placing explosives to detonate the beating heart of the vessel. But the Minotaurs were far from always successful. The Lamenters had the innate advantage of the defensive architecture of their warships, and each and every one of these boarding actions could grind on for hours of bloody, brutal close quarters combat in the darkened inside of the ships, even as their weapons were still rattling out a continuous stream of firepower and one another. And despite their seemingly hopeless position, the Lamenters were not giving up without one hell of a fight. Even worse was the battle down on the surface of the planet. The Minotaurs may have been able to simply ignore it, to fight the Lamenters in orbit and then threaten to bombard the residents left on the planet, but Asterion Moloch would not have it so. His enemy had presented themselves to him. They had issued challenge, and by the god Empress seat, he would accept it. He was not about to bombard the Lamenters, nor was he about to risk them scattering across the surface of the planet, only to return to haunt him later. No, if they wanted a fight, the Minotaurs would happily oblige, as they landed in equal numbers and engaged the Lamenters in running battles across the surface, bringing down their armor and heavy weaponry to hammer at the sons of Sanguinius. Besides, what could this battered, bedraggled chapter really do in the face of the full force of the Minotaurs? They would surrender soon enough, a notion that prevailed for the first hour, two hours of the conflict. 
By the third, fourth, and fifth hours, it was beginning to look like a quite a quaint idea, as the Lamenters were not only showing no signs of withdrawing, they were launching their own counterattacks into the Minotaur's fleet formations, causing severe damage to their warships and even successfully counterboarding several and destroying them. In great gleams of plasma detonations that could be seen as momentary stars, spotted by a keen eye fighting down down on the surface of the planet. Well, the Minotaurs were not faring all that much better. Despite a crushing superiority in heavy armor, the Lamenters kept on fighting. The Minotaurs considered it a great honor to be dispatched against disloyal Astartes, seeing it as one of the greatest services they could possibly offer to the Imperium. They had fought more than their fair share of brother space marines and knew precisely what it took to put one down. And yet the Lamenters, despite suffering wounds that should have dropped them thrice over, simply kept firing. Every last one had to be blasted from his feet, either via explosives, whirlwind barrages, or bolt of fire, and then run through with spears. Even then, he might very well wrap bloody fingers around the haft in a desperate attempt to snap it off and drag the man behind it down with him in death. But whereas this blatant display of desperate defiance may have disheartened many an enemy, the Minotaurs simply smiled. This was the kind of battle they had been made for, and this was precisely the enemy they were supposed to wage it against. They drove on with increased ferocity and brutality. If the Lamenters would not fall from bolt of fire alone, by the Guard Emperor the Minotaurs would hack them limb from limb until nothing moved. It appeared like all the world as if this battle would end only with the complete annihilation of one of the two warring sides. But after 16 hours, the Minotaur's superior numbers and firepower had finally begun to spread out and shatter the Lamenters. For a long time, it seemed like this battle would only end with the absolute annihilation of one of the two warring factions, but after 12 hours, the Minotaurs finally began to make their advantages thoroughly felt. Superiority in both numbers, firepower, and positioning was beginning to scatter the Lamenters, breaking up their cohesion, destroying their battle plans, and whittling their squads down brother by brother. Until on the 17th hour, after a lengthy boarding action that saw the halls and corridors of the Mater Lacrimarum running red with superhuman blood, the battle barge, minutes before the command bridge was finally breached, sent out the surrender signal. I imagine a handful of truly tense moments passed, as the melter cutters were still sizzling against the bulkhead doors to the command chamber. Would the Minotaurs even accept it? Had the Imperium condemned the Lamenters completely? But eventually, an acknowledgement came back over the command channels, ordering all the remaining Lamenters' forces to lay down their arms and surrender themselves to the Minotaurs. They would accept their surrender. A fact that speaks highly of the esteem that the Minotaurs now held the Lamenters in for their defiance for the Minotaurs had been made to bleed profusely for this victory. They had forced the Lamenters to surrender, and therefore removed them from the board, with only 311 Battle Brothers surviving. This number, by the way, included those already near mortally wounded aboard the Lamenters' battle barge. The total of warriors that fought in the battle and surrendered, therefore, is likely to be less than 200, out of a starting force of some perhaps five to 600. And included amongst the chapter's survivors was their chapter master, Malakim Foros, who would now lead them into inquisitorial captivity and the mercy of Legate Inquisitor Jan Dice Frey. 
He in turn chose to suspend any immediate sentencing or investigation of the Lamenters until the Badab conflict had been fully resolved uh, and their potential involvement in any heretical activity therefore could be investigated at greater length. Meanwhile, what remained of the chapter would be interned on a massive specially constructed prison hulk in stable orbit around Sagan, with plentiful weapon batteries pointed at it, should the Lamenters for any reason choose to challenge the ruling. As for the Minotaurs, they had entered the battle at near full chapter strength, their scout corps having been enough to replace any previous casualties in engaging the Lamenters and Executioners through the Pale Stars. A thousand brothers, then they were reduced to close to half of their full strength, having lost some three to four hundred during the battle, many of which, of course, due to the incredible resilience of Astarte's physiology, would no doubt fight again at some time. Nevertheless, these were the kind of casualties that would normally see a chapter withdraw from a conflict to recuperate for an extended period. But the Minotaurs were dedicated for the long term, and instead they merely claimed salvage rights of the battlefield, including the Lamenter's warships and their war gear. <laughs> I'm sure more than one Lamenter hoped that their war gear, ever so prone to random failure, would serve their new Minotaur masters in much the same way it so often had served and failed the Lamenters. <laughs> oh really? You want my bolt pistol, do you? Well, you're welcome to it. You might want to clear the jam, though. No, 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 it's not jammed now, but... <laughs> believe you me, it won't be long. Oh, and as for our starships, oh, would you mind taking our astropaths along with you as well? And as a friendly advice between brothers, should you someday, suddenly, for no particular reason whatsoever, find yourselves stuck? In a toxically irradiated star system with no way to escape, always carry a second bolt pistol as well to, uh, grant the Emperor's mercy to yourself. In case, again, for no reason whatsoever, the one I just handed you chooses that particular situation to have a catastrophic malfunction. Something tells me that the Minotaurs will be melting down most of the weaponry and war gear in short order, presumably turning them into objects of loathing and hatred, or potentially toilets for the lower surfing classes, just as a form of revenge. <laughs> ah, Lamenters and their war gear. Then again, who knows, it might simply just be their curse. On the other hand, I seem to recall the Minotaurs also coming from the Cursed Founding. Hmm. <laughs> yes, I think I'll stick with my melted down to toiletry idea. But, on a slightly more serious note again, this battle had considerable implications for the wider war. With the Lamenters now also officially defeated, Lufthuron stood alone with only one remaining ally. And not much of one either, to be honest. The executioners were fine warriors and good raiders, no doubt about it, but they weren't really under Lufthuron's command, now were they? Huron would get to feel a little bit of the pain of Carab Cullen, of having military forces under his technical command that treated his orders with the kind of casual disregard mixed with creative interpretation as to make them almost the same as the enemy in that particular respect. The executioners would fight, but they would not fight where Lufthuron wished it. And with the Mantis warriors equally separated, the Astral Claws stood all but alone now, against the full force of the Loyalists. 
He still had the Badab system, of course, and perhaps Huron still clung to the idea of making himself so prickly as to force some kind of stalemate or peace. Though, this was an ever more distant and frankly foolish hope at this point. As for the fate of the Lamenters, well, they finally found Battle Brothers that would come to their aid when required, that would defend them even against the Inquisition, that would give them a home and fight alongside them. And those Battle Brothers turned out to be secessionist traitors, with a penchant for increasing their numbers well beyond Codex approved limits. <laughs> and some people still doubt the curse of the Lamenters. On the bright side, they weren't simply flat out executed or eradicated by the Minotaurs, who absolutely did have the strength and the capacity to do so. Again, whilst the Minotaurs are no blood maddened berserkers, they will more than happily do whatever it takes even if that means putting a bolt round through a wounded Lamenter lying in an apothecarium cot. Legate Inquisitor John Dice Frain also displayed a remarkable self-control for a man of his standing, in not simply choosing to make yet another example out of the Lamenters. Perhaps there is some sense to the man still, and the Lamenters had made a more than adequate fight out of it. Presuming their relative innocence could be proven, they might still serve the Imperium, and as of yet there had been no evidence that they had increased their numbers in the same way that the Astral Claws had. Perhaps guilt by proximity will not be applied to our brave boys in yellow, at least this once. One can but hope. Anywho, I'll wrap that up there. This was a little bit of a short one, but I feel the Lamenters deserve their own special mention, frankly. So, until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.